Welcome to the Foss North pre-show. It's been a challenging time with Corona, but thanks to all our sponsors, our amazing speakers and our awesome community, we're turning this into a virtual event. I'm really looking forward to the coming day. And in this show, we will discuss the coming talks. Starting tomorrow at nine o'clock, we have a talk on reuse, which is a tool to insert and uh, also check copyright and license and, and, uh, tags in your source code. Uh, for me, this is kind of a good tool because it makes software more easily checked for compliance. Is it per project or is it for a, for a code base? Do you know that, the reuse tool? Uh, it's it's working on it. It's supplying license and copyright and what have you authorship or whatever to uh, per file, and then you can so like, uh, like that for information it. and also create a bill of material, which is nice. Um, cool. Yeah, well, that that's a good intro to the first block actually because it it's very licensing focused in the beginning. Uh, so I mean the the next talk is about the the KDE Free Cute Foundation, which, which sort of connects to to what Frank talked about this morning. Um, so I so the line here, pardon? I sent the red line. <laughs> <laughs> no, so so QT has a CLA, which you can think what what you like about, but it, it's dual licensed, and and that means that you you have to license your contributions as a contributor to the Cute code base. Uh, the KDE Free Cute Foundation uh, governs so that the Cute company or the the owner of the commercial license, so to speak, uh, or the reseller of that one, um, actually upstreams their patches or makes them available to uh, to the open source community in a timely manner, uh, or otherwise they can sort of trigger a, a relicensing of the code base to what I believe is BSD, um, and this is what Adrian will be talking about. Mm -hmm. And then comes Pavel, hacking the legal code of an open source license. And as far as I understand, it's mostly about that you need to read uh, all the licenses and reinterpret yourself uh, for yourself or call, or call a lawyer and he will be kind of explaining how you would do it or something like that. Yeah, as I understand it, Pavel works at the law firm. I'm not sure if he's a lawyer per se, but he works with licenses from a legal perspective. So, so that's actually a very interesting take. And he works in the Swedish, uh, what do you say, law space. Um, so, so I guess he knows how open source licenses connect to, to Swedish contexts. Mm, okay. Everything I know about lawyers and uh, licenses is that they try to stop you <laughs> by any means to do anything. <laughs> yeah, let's <laughs> let's hit him with hard questions. I mean, he's yeah. last before lunch. We can grill him for two hours. <laughs> Some lawyers focus on the word risk when, when it comes to open source and free software. Yeah. Oh, but I, I need to point out some because I'm working with a lawyer that does not. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there are good lawyers as well. We we should say that as well. <laughs> to me, this is. Uh, I, uh, I shouldn't say best part because that would be peeing on other speakers. But for, for me, this is closest to, to my my current profession, and I and I actually enjoy working with licenses. Uh, I think it's kind of fun. So yeah. don't hate me now. No, I I agree. Licenses are much more fun than you would expect them to be, because it's it's like a lot of uh, philosoph philosophy in in it, which. Uh, which makes it, that's the fun part of it. Yeah, and, and to me it was a revelation in, in, in late 90s when I read the uh, like manifestos, the four freedoms of the GNU project and I, I noticed directly, okay, this is me, this is me. So I, I've, been, I've been there ever since and reading GPL v2 was part of it and then I read all the licenses and to me it kind of made sense. So I've, I've stayed there. Hmm. Yeah, and as a developer, I think it's important to actually know your licenses. I mean, you, you can approach them by saying open source, and then you have the permissive and the, the non-permissive licenses, but really understanding how they tick, or at least a few of them, makes it a lot easier to relate to all of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's so many stupid misconceptions about licenses, what you have to and what you have and don't have to do. And I think there's a big company somewhere in the US, close to Redmond somewhere, that started spreading a lot of 
fad and that same fad is still around. True. I yes. avoided naming the company. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then we do have uh, 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 in the afternoon, we have a talk by SVT, the online video at SVT. Yeah, they actually spoke last year as well. So, so the SVT, for those of you who do not know, it's the, the Swedish television, so like our BBC. Um, and, and they have a lot of open source on the inside in their actual broadcasting software. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that talk. Yeah, just your Maria DB, Redis, all the stuff which you, we all know and love in, from the web, basically. <laughs> yeah, and it sounds like they're going to give us a, a tour of their platform and how how they I build mean, things. It, 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 it must be sounds a really... like this was not always the case as well. Uh, okay, using FOSS as an actual thing. So it's it's nice to see someone who has made the split, the, the, not the split, the switch uh, to it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the, the whole afternoon tomorrow will it be about applications. So, so we start with SVT and, and the next slot is from the, the Swedish labor market, Arbetsförmedling, and I'm not sure how to translate that, but the, the place you go to look for a job. Uh, and, and they basically build a, a, a job searching platform for both employees and employers uh, based on open source. Um, and, and open standards, uh, which they want to discuss in, in what benefits they've had from, from sort of opening up their code base and, and going there, which, which relates to this public code, public money, which I'm very fond of. Yeah. Do you know if they do it internally or do they bring some company in which does it or? I think they do it internally. From, from the email addresses, I believe that Jonas, uh, one of the speakers, has an arbitsfilling.se email while Johan is probably a contractor because he had another one or he simply did the application for the talk using his private email. I, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it seems like the software development is done in-house uh, or at least in, they have people embedded in this who knows the work. Okay. It would be interesting to hear their view on this public money, public code thing, because as far as I know, this is still very much optional in, in Sweden, at least. Yeah, I mean, it's the uh, the law of, of fen, what do you say? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Log of and Leo the, the law of uh, public procurement, something like that. It, it makes it really hard to buy open source because it's... But it's the same thing. If you if you throw out a, a number of requirements, it's very hard to miss open source instead of yeah. adopting an open source project and 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 taking the benefits from it. So, so you need. Well, I, suppose, to I suppose when you do new new development, then you hire contractors uh, for that. That could be one of the requirements. That, that should yeah, exactly. be so hard, yeah. should it? Yeah, exactly. But then you take the responsibility on developing the function instead of asking for the function from an external mm -hmm. supplier. So it's yeah. Let's ask them. We have a good Q&A. Exactly. <laughs> and then we can continue with another one. So the, the Swedish labor market one is half an hour talk and the other one is also half an hour talk and it's about process automation uh, based on open source. Uh, so this RPA or robotic process automation as I understand is, is about automating processes using AI or, or sort of having automated bots in in an actual business pro process, checking stuff and, and also sort of moving things along. Yeah. So, so that's an automation tool chain in, in a different setting, basically. In a business setting, basically, yeah. yeah, yeah. It sounds like a talk we had uh, a few years ago, right? About uh, this uh, online um, sysadmin interface thing where they had in, in the, in the development organization, they had developed a bunch of bots that would automatically check uh, pull requests or even create pull requests for simple bugs and stuff. Maybe it's maybe it's something similar to that. Yeah, let's have a look. But it, it sounds interesting. To, to me, it sounds like it's more uh, non-developer related processes, which might make it cool to actually deploy the tools that we take for granted mm. in, in other areas of business. Sort of cutting through the red tape, I guess. Yeah. And then we end with a, with a speaker who we know seen before, uh, Dimitros Platis, um, who is currently teaching part-time at the university. Um, 
and he uses open source quite a lot in his courses to sort of, as I understand it, show his students actually what a real system looks like instead of using small contrived examples to, to really show them the real world. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess once you have a once you have a full system easily set up using open source tools, then why not use it? Yeah, exactly. And he does the the courses I've seen. So, so I've done like guest lectures, scaring students with him, uh, and and then it's really been about uh, building like Arduino robots and things like that. So then you're starting from open hardware and well, building on the shoulders of giants instead of writing everything yourself. You will actually get much further along. The exactly. project. I remember him showing me this this system where he has a car with an Arduino on it, and then there would be some kind of an AI running on the Arduino with help of a lot of uh, open source stuff, which would just pull pull in the data from the sensors and try to try to drive around and so on, which is then obviously much more uh, tangible for for the students to understand what's going on than just like some whiteboard code. <laughs> exactly. No, and wasn't that what he did his lightning talk about? Oh yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. At least he showed the car. Uh, I, I was very focused on the technology during those talks. <laughs> I don't remember the exact contents. Yeah. He does a lot of hardware tinkering and so on. He is a software guy, but he, he does a lot of hardware stuff uh, during his uh, private hour, basically. Yeah. <laughs> No, but it, it looks like it'll be a fun day tomorrow. And the, the times are the same as today. So, so we do one block in the morning, 9 to 12, uh, and then one in the afternoon, 2 to 5. Great. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing all our viewers and making yeah. sure that all the speakers show up on time. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. See you tomorrow. See you. Yeah.